Hello, Pastor Doug, back again with another video. Today I want to continue going through 60 faith questions I hope to answer before my kids leave home, because I actually really like these some of these questions. Um, I like answering simple questions that average Christians have, because that's really useful. Sometimes pastors can get so excited about being stuck in the weeds, they forget the basic questions that most parishioners have, that most Christians have, and by the way, all Christians have. So we did last time the Bible. And this time I want to do prayer. So as always, I'm going to do these off the cuff. I'm going to hopefully give a quick direct answer and well, let's see where we go. So the first question, how often should you pray? Well, granted scripture says you should pray without ceasing, you know, to have that, that focus on God throughout your life. But the Bible really doesn't give you just a simple checklist of prayer because there's a lot of freedom in prayer. Now, if you do want a checklist, if you're one of those people, and I know Calvin had a great suggestion, I mean, he suggested, you know, when you wake up in the morning, pray, when you go to bed, pray, before each meal, pray, before any great undertaking, pray, pray. Um, if anything dramatic happens to you for good or for ill, pray. I mean, those are good guidelines we read in Scripture where people pray in those circumstances. Uh, I know like I always, as a family, we have a habit. We all we always pray before we leave. We head out of the garage and get in our car first time we pray. But there's no legalistic rule here. You know, you forget a dinner prayer and therefore you've engaged in grievous sin. There's a lot of freedom in prayer and prayer is simply you talking to God. So I know for myself, I love meditating upon scripture. I love praying when I walk. I, I don't know why there's something about movement and prayer that go well together, at least for me. So you should pray frequently, but don't be legalistic about it. It's simply a conversation you're having with God. You're talking to God. So number two, what should you pray about? Literally anything. Prayer is you talking to God, and your Heavenly Father loves you in Christ, so you can turn all things over to Him. Yes, there should be some understanding that, okay, maybe that'd be a little selfish, but you can still ask that, but then you correct yourself. It's like, Lord, I really, really would like a red Corvette, but yeah, I know that's materialistic. Help me with that, Lord. Because again, as long as you don't blaspheme in your prayers, and by the way, you can be blunt with God. Go read the book of Job. And why am I suffering, Lord? Stop this. Have mercy. Totally fine. Again, read Job. And Job speaks well of God as we read it in the end of the book. But you can turn over all things onto God. But as you pray, hopefully your theology will more and more kick in. You know, even the Lord Jesus said, you know, if it's thy, you know, if possible, take this cup from me, but not my will, but yours be done. That's an extraordinary prayer. I mean, the Lord who is without sin asked not to go to the cross. He knew that was his whole mission. But because he ended with that, not my will, but yours be done. He turned over all his fears, all his concerns onto his father. And he was is without sin, yet fully human. So what's number three? How do you listen to God in prayer? Oh, that's a really good question. Ready for this? I don't. Now, you might be aghast by that, and I mean that in a narrow sense. Of course, there's times I feel like God speaks to me in prayer. There's been times I felt really comforted in prayer. Don't get me wrong, that can happen. But I think it's a huge mistake to assume God is going to speak to you in prayer. I don't know where in Scripture that, that's literally stated. The normal way God speaks to us is the preaching of His Word. You go to the Lord's Day, you hear Scripture read, you hear, the, you hear the sermon proclaimed, and you receive the sacraments. That's God speaking to you. And He speaks to you in law, here's what you should be doing and don't doing, and that should convict you. And He also speaks to you in the Gospel. This is who you are in Christ, and you're fully forgiven. And you're under His mercy. So many Christians goof this up. They assume prayer is the main way God speaks to us. That's not what the Bible teaches. Again, when you go to church, when you hear the word preached, when you receive the sacraments, that's God speaking to you. That's the normal way God has ordained how to speak. Prayer is us speaking to God. And there's lots of freedom because, again, our Heavenly Father wants to hear us. Can God convict us in prayer? Sure. No doubt, you know, you, you, you're like, you're t being tempted with evil, and, and as you pray, a scripture comes to mind and it convicts you. Is that God speaking? Sure. 
But don't make the mistake of trying to make God speak to you in prayer. That's not what the Bible teaches, and so many Christians make that mistake. Number four, what is the point of thanking God for things he didn't directly give us? Um, well, I'm a good Calvinist. God gives us everything. You know, whether it seems to be supernatural or just through uh, secondary means, all things are from God. So even if something just minor happens to you and it's a normal way, you get your paycheck. That's from God. And you should thank him because all things are from God. So, you know, do you notice here? Your theology helps your prayer. The better of a biblical systematic theology you'll have, you will help you in prayer. Um, though a warning, you can have really, really good theology and, and not, you know, sometimes be weak at prayer. That can happen, but the two should come together. What does it mean to ask God for forgiveness? What does it mean to ask God for forgiveness? I'm not sure what this person is asking, but this is a great question. Uh, we all need forgiveness. I mean, yes, we are fully forgiven in Christ, but we stumble and we make mistakes and we sin as we wrestle with that old man of sin. You know, do we love God perfectly in our actions? No, and that's why we need sanctification. Yes, we're fully forgiven in Christ, but we turn and we ask for forgiveness. And so, I mean, what does it mean? You have to know that you've sinned. Um, that means you have to understand God's law. You ask for his mercy. Uh, you name it and claim it. It's the only time I like that phrase, name it and claim it in prayer. You know, Lord, I've engaged in this sin. Forgive me. Uh, if there's an opportunity to make restitution, you do this. You know, Lord, I'm sorry I stole from the 7-Eleven yesterday. Well, then you go to the 7-Eleven and you go to the police and you cop to, uh, to your crimes. But forgiveness is above all, first and foremost, from the Lord. So, you, you need to know your sin, so some, some self-reflection is necessary, some use of the law is necessary, and also, by the way, the church is there. A healthy church will correct you, and so th the church can roll in. And by the way, the church can be wonderful balancing in this, because some people can get so focused on minor sins, they think they have no forgiveness, and the church says, no, 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 look, look you're wrestling with that, but that's okay, but you're forgiven in the gospel, and here's the gospel, and the gospel is proclaimed to you. Conversely, some people can be so deluded, you know, it's like, ah, it's okay if I commit adultery, and then the church would roll in and says, no heathen, repent, or there's going to be consequences. So the church can also be a guide. That's, that's a great question. I'd love to talk to the person and ask fully what they meant. When should you ask for forgiveness? Constantly. <laughs> Both for particular sins, you know, oh Lord, I am sorry because I yelled at my spouse at it without any justification, and I repent, and you go and apologize to your spouse. But also, even if you don't sin, you ask for Christ's mercy. I mean, again, think of Job. Job deeply repents at the end. And though yet God said he's a righteous man, because we still wrestle with that old man of sin and we ask for mercy. Yes, we're covered in the blood of Christ, but to be dependent upon Christ is what we desire. So for particular sins, but also just for a general condition, that old man again of sin that we wrestle with. How should you ask for forgiveness? Uh, again, name it, acclaim it, proclaim it, uh, state it, state it unto the Lord directly, ask for mercy, know that you're forgiven, and if possible, make restitution. And if you can't make restitution for you know whatever reason, the person you wronged is now dead, you know, for example, understand your forgiveness comes from God and not from that person. Number eight. What are ways to use a prayer list to bolster your prayer life? If you're into lists, you can. I confess I'm not. Um, the only time I make a list is because I'm a pastor, and then when people ask to pray, you know, pastor would pray for me, I, I try to make a list so I don't forget, because I, I do try to pray uh, for the saints, as, as a pastor should. Um, but if you like lists, you can do that. I know I've met many people who have made a list, and they check off lists, and they're amazed by God's mercy. But you don't have to make a list. Again, there's great freedom in prayer. Prayer is you talking to God. And because of the blood of Christ, your Heavenly Father wants to hear from you. Why are many prayers unanswered? Because it pleases God. 
God is sovereign. And praise him, he doesn't answer all our prayers because he's working out his perfect will. And yes, we might suffer great evil, and we get to call it evil. We get to complain unto the Lord. We get to seek justice in this world, if that's appropriate. But it's by his doing, and we have to rest in that. And in the end, trust that our Heavenly Father is doing us good, and that we can't see it on this side of heaven. He is doing it. Because again, back to that most supreme virtue, we trust in the Lord. Number 10, how do you become comfortable praying out loud? Well, the quick answer is you do it. Um, I, I think there is a, a, a wisdom to learning how to pray out loud. I don't know where in Scripture it literally says you pray out loud, though, of course, there's many times when people do pray out loud. Obviously, in your leadership, you should get used to praying out loud. I mean, that's kind of a, one, of the, one of the basic requirements for a pastor. But it does help focus you. Um, you can do it in private. I know a lot of times, like when I walk, I know I'm not around, I, I talk out loud. It does help to organize your thoughts. But again, there's freedom in this. And so many Christians mess this up. I know I preached on prayer very incorrectly for the few beginning years of my, as a minister, because I tried to make it so legalistic, and it's not. Again, get the direction right. It's you talking to God. And there is great freedom in that. You know, when in doubt, what did the Lord Jesus say? Say this prayer. And it's in Luke, you know, the short version of the Lord's Prayer. When in doubt, pray the Lord's Prayer. That is fine and that is beautiful. Should you strive to try to improve your prayer life? Absolutely. But again, prayer is a blessing. It's not supposed to be a curse. Number 11, what are ways to pray for other people? Um, do it. Um, I, that, that's an interesting question. I think most people have an easy time praying for other people. I mean, yes, we turn over our fears and desires, but actually from my experience, we kind of default praying for other people first and then ourselves because you know, we feel selfish. And by the way, you, by all means, you can pray for yourself. There's great freedom in prayer. You know, if you want a template, you know, take the Lord's Prayer and Matthew and unpack it and see the different focuses, you know, praying for yourself, praying for others, praying for mercy, praying, thanking unto God, praising God. You know, the, uh, there's different aspects to prayer in the Sermon on the Mount, uh, sorry, uh, well, the Lord's Prayer, which is found in the Sermon on the Mount, uh, Matthew chapter 5 through 7, is a good outline. But uh, do it. I, I, I guess well, another advice would be not, there's always a danger of being self-righteous. You know, I hope they come to their senses, Lord. Yeah, there's a place to pray for that, but, you know, be careful of uh, the twig in your neighbor's eye and you don't see the log in your own. Um, and by the way, you can you should pray for your enemies, and but you can also pray for unjust, uh, against the wicked. Personally, when it comes to imprecatory prayers, praying against the wicked, um, I personally don't name them as individuals, but I will name them as the abstract. You know, Lord, uh, I, I pray that wicked judges that are pro-murdering unborn children, um, that there be justice and they be removed. But then you start listing the judges by name and you pray for mercy and you understand they are leaders of this, you know, they're leaders in this nation. And we're called to pray positively for the magistrate. That's personally my approach. Well, I hope this helps. Um, I, I love these questions on prayer. But again, let me emphasize, the direction is you to God, not necessarily God to you. The direction that happens of God to you is the, is the ministry of the Word, the reading of Scripture, the preaching of the Word, and the administration of the sacraments. And in prayer, there is great freedom. Your Heavenly Father loves you. He wants to hear from you. And you can turn over all things unto Him. Well, I hope that helps. And it's always Christ's grace and peace to you all. Amen.